my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Grizel Hernandez. She's going to be speaking about engaging heart, mind, and hands, a Latina holistic nurse leadership journey guided by Watson Unitary Caring Science. So Grizel um, is one of our board members, um, and we are just so excited she's joining us today. She is the executive director at Stanford Health Care Center for Education and Professional Development. She has 20 years of nursing professional development experience in ANCC Magnet and the Malcolm Bridge National Quality Award designated organization. Grizel is an adjunct faculty for Watson Caring Science Institute and a founding member of Regional Caritas Consortium in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and California. You have been very busy, Dr. Hernandez. <laughs> she had also coordinates the opera, operalization and integration plan of Watson's Caring Science Theory into practice, education, leadership, and research at Stanford Healthcare. She has a BSN from the University of Pennsylvania, a master's of public health from UCLA, and a PhD in nursing from the University of Colorado Antwerp Medical Campus. Her qualitative research study aimed to describe and understand the lived experience of nurse pra nurses practicing Watson Caring Science from, from a Watson Caring Science Framework, AKA Caritas Coaches, creating a caring healing environment for staff, which is so critical. We look forward to hearing what you have, Grizel. Welcome, thank you for being with us. And I will let you uh, take it from here. Thank you, uh, Margaret. And thank you everybody for taking time out of your own busy schedule to come in having this conversation <laughs> together. And I, I hope that I don't do much talking and that we can really engage in a dialogue. Um, so my, my presentation, uh, I'm going to have a couple of slides just to kind of set the stage and it will be basically uh, taking you into a little journey of my upbringing and how that kind of manifested into the work that I'm doing right now. So if you allow me, let me uh, share my screen. Let me know if you can see it. Can you see my screen? Yes. What do you see? Because I, I I have many screens that I don't know what I'm showing right now. <laughs> you see the title? It's your beautiful heart with the engagement okay, good. arms and hands. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so like I said, uh, my presentation is going to be uh, a journey through how uh, I'm engaging my heart, my mind, and my hands, if you will, um, as a Latina uh, holistic nurse uh, in my leadership role. And uh, this is what I'm going to do my best to share with you. I'm going to kind of give you some statistics and some definitions as it relates to uh, Hispanics in the United States and in nursing. Um, I will share with you my origin story. Uh, also, my uh, Watson Unitary Caring Science journey. Uh, a little bit more about my dissertation and some of the work that I'm currently doing with Dr. Dean Watson on my postdoctoral work in caring science. And then we'll have some time for some reflections um, and how we, uh, I'll be curious to know what you guys think of the work that I'm presenting to you. So just let's start with basics. Um, when we actually look at the, uh, U.S. Census, in 2021, the U.S. Hispanic population reached more than 62 million people. Uh, so they, actually, the actual number is like 62.6. .6. And this basically, it's a makeup of 19% of the total uh, nation population, um, which both are high, uh, pretty high. Um, compared to uh, other, other years. We also know that in uh, 2021, when we did the census, there were some concerns 
around the questions that they were being asked. Um, and, and chances are that this number is probably underrepresented because I know of some people who did not complete the census because they were concerned about what they were going to do with that information. If we move, so what's in the name, right? When we talk about Hispanics, there's many definitions. I, I introduce myself in the flyer uh, for this presentation as Latina. There, there's the, the language of Hispanic. So I wanted to kind of set the stage so that we know what that means. So Hispanics and Latinos are often used interchangeably through, uh, although they really mean two different things. Hispanics refer to people who speak Spanish or are descendants from Spanish speaking populations while Latinos refer to people who are from or descendants from people from Latin America. So when we talk about Hispanics, it excludes people from Brazil where Portuguese is spoken. And then when we talk about Latinos, we exclude, um, we include uh, Brazil, but then we exclude people from Spain or from Portugal. So that's why more often than not, you see the two of them kind of side by side with um, a dash be uh, between them. Then um, more recently, we basically, when, when, we, you, when you talk to people who you might consider Hispanic or Latinos, um, we usually don't embrace those, <laughs> don't, we don't call ourselves that. Um, we don't give ourselves those labels uh, that, uh, and it's not widely used by us. Now, more recently in the past 10 years or so, the term Latinx has emerged as an alternative to Hispanics or Latinos and it's mostly used in the news, entertainment, universities, uh, local government, and maybe even corporations to kind of describe a uh, Hispanic population. And it has been seen um, as a gender and LG LGBTQ inclusive term. But again, when you actually look at the um, uh, statistics, only about 3% of the Hispanic population, first of all, knows about it or even uses it. Yeah. And then one that has been um, has been emerging um, as of late, especially in uh, countries where Spanish is spoken, is Latine, which is a new gender neutral pan ethnic um, label that is used in basically in other countries that, uh, where people speak Spanish. So as you can see, there's many, many ways that uh, we can be described depending on how that connects with us. The Pew Research Center actually asked whether or not people, uh, Hispanics, um, how, they, how they view or how they describe themselves more often. And as you can see from this um, graph, uh, people tend to describe themselves more often by the country of their heritage, right? Mexican, Cuban, uh, Dominican, Puerto Rican, uh, Ecuadorian, et cetera. And then when it comes to Latino and Hispanic, there's, little, uh, there's really no preference on that. So let me go to the next one. So that, that said, let's talk about um, the diversity of our nursing workforce as it relates to our, um, our Hispanic or Latino um, uh, colleagues. So according to the 2020 survey conducted by the National Council of State Boards of Nursing and the Forum of State Nursing Workforce Centers, uh, nurses from minority backgrounds represented roughly 19.4% of registered nurses. And when we actually do the breakdown, only about 5.6 of the RN workforce reports their ethnicity as Hispanic. 
when we actually go to the same um, survey and look at the LVN or LPN um, breakdown, uh, ethnicity breakdown, we see that Hispanic or Latinx ancestry is reported at around 10% of that workforce. So if we are good to compare that, you know, that the United States, the Hispanic population is 19% of the overall patient, uh, overall population, which is the largest minority group in the United States, and only 5.6% um, of us are uh, nurses, we know that there is uh, a need to increase our diversity when it comes to um, the Hispanic uh, population, nursing. The other thing, um, Ray and Margaret and I were, were talking about how does that compare to our specialty in holistic nursing? And they shared with me that of a total, as of August, of the total of 29, uh, 2,990 total certifications, um, only 2008, uh, or 2008 um, did not declare whether or not they, uh, they uh, are members um, of a particular uh, ethnicity or race group. So only around 982 kind of declare that um, they are, are, are members of either a race or an ethnicity. And of those, 5.6 identify themselves as Hispanics, which kind of similar to the number of nurses that we have um, of Hispanic heritage. So I thought that that was kind of interesting. So who am I or what am I, right? When I think about um, where do I come from, I, if I look at my DNA, and this is from 2023 20, and me as of this morning, <laughs> <laughs> apparently um, I am 66.9% Spanish and Portuguese. I am 10.1% indigenous uh, American and actually um, from the Tainos, who are part of the Atacuan Nation, which are the native peoples of the Caribbean in Florida around the time when the Europeans uh, came to America. And then I am roughly 17 point something percent um, African. So, and, and I'm very curious about the uh, unidentified 1.1% that is the, the little crazy in me. I think I'm probably alien. Um, I have some alien DNA on that one. So this is my family. This is me when I was a little girl. You can see that my family comes in every uh, color. Um, I'm, there's a, my mom and my dad both uh, passed away. But as you can tell, you know, as you can see, um, we we are basically all different kinds of shades. And I am just, as my mom used to call me, a delicious, I, I'm a taco, a delicious blend of uh, spices and, um, and herbs. <laughs> so my orange story. So what I am, I consider myself Puerto Rican. That is who I am. Um, but there's some, something more um, uh, underneath the DNA uh, that kind of gets transmitted in the way that I relate with everything uh, that I do. I come from a family, I was born in Puerto Rico. Um, and when I was 13 years old, I moved to the United, I, I moved to New Jersey. My parent, my family moved to New Jersey. Um, so I, I have a sense of what it is to be Puerto Rican, um, you know, as, as a teenager, as a young girl and uh, preteen. And then um, growing up, I've been longer here in the United States in the mainland than I've been in Puerto Rico. Um, I come from a family of activists and a family of artists. Great storytellers, poets, singers, uh, guitar players, uh, painters, um, et cetera. Um, 
I grew up with a family with a very deep connection with the spirit world. And from a very early age, very much, um, there was a, a big integration of um, basically uh, traditional uh, 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 medicine. And um, basically, I probably went to see uh, curanderas before I even went to the, to the pediatrician. <laughs> so so my family had pretty much what we called a pharmacy in the back of the house, which meant that there were a lot of herbs. And every time your tummy aches, we're going to have some ginger. You're, mm -hmm. uh, you can't sleep. You're going to have some chamomile tea, et cetera. So I grew up with that sense of um, having a, a, a close relationship with the earth and an understanding that there was something bigger than I. And as I share with many people, um, there the the having conversations around politics and the things that were happening around us um we could have that and at the same time talk about um the spirit and angels and it was normal conversation like nobody thought that there was anything strange about it i also come from a family that has very deep um sense of social justice and advocacy. And we grew up with very strong, what I like to call um, four key Puerto Rican um, core cultural values. And I wrote them here in Spanish, but I would say them in English. Authenticity, respect, compassion, and humility. Those four things were basically ingrained in myself and my brother from a very young age. And we were, my parents were very clear with me, with us, that our role in this earth was to be at the service of others. And that whatever we did, we needed to go to school, we needed to go to college, there was no ifs and buts about it. And what we did, not only were we, we, were we to get an education, the path within higher education that we needed to, to get ourselves into, that was the only request that they made, was for us to choose something that was for the service of another. So I chose social work. I did that before I became a nurse. And then nursing chose me. That is how I like to uh, explain that to people. And I saw both as sacred acts to be of service to my fellow human beings. I am also a kind of person and probably because of my upbringing that seeks inspiration and purpose in what I do. And there has to be some clear alignment between my values not only my uh, values, my family values, but also my professional values mm -hmm. and the work that I do with that. If there is no congruency there, I feel off at times. So I knew that when I went into social work and I also knew that when, um, when the decision was made by the universe that I was gonna be a nurse. So when I became, um, when I familiarized myself with Watson, uh, unitary caring science, that became foundational to both my personal and my professional life because I saw the alignment um, between my personal values and how um, nursing was viewed through that perspective. So here is my um, 27 year plus journey through Watson unitary caring science. Um, it started in nursing school. I was introduced to Watson Caring Science and Holistic Nursing at the University of Pennsylvania when I was doing my undergraduate um, degree there. Um, and I'm fond of saying, and Jean is here, and she probably heard me say this many times. I remember listening to an interview uh, Dr. Jackie Fawcett was my, my instructor, and she had done this whole series of videos about um, the living um, theorist 
and it was Newman and uh, Rogers and Watson, et cetera. And um, the one, I, I probably understood half of the things that Jean was talking about. On the, I remember writing things down and saying, well, I probably need to find a dictionary if I know what these words mean, because I don't know what ontology means or ontological means and phenomenological <laughs> means. I, I had no clue what that was. And all I kept thinking about was, I hope this is not going to be on the test, right? Um, so, however, I could... I understood in my soul, I understood at the deepest uh, levels of my being what she was talking about. And I remember thinking that is the kind of nurse that I want to be when I grow up. That is how I want others to see me. I want love and caring, Caritas to be the kind of consciousness that I want to um, exude when I am in the presence of another human being. So, so it became my quest to learning more about holistic nursing. I completed uh, the Integrative Healing Arts uh, Certificate Program with Birch Tree with health, Healthcare Transformation. And I remember that we needed to identify aid a uh, holistic nurse uh, to kind of run all of our reflections through that. And I chose Jean Watson. I completed my cert, um, board certification in holistic nursing. And I remember, I don't know how, how it's done now, but I remember when I did it in 2006, um, we needed to do some reflection questions and it was the same thing. I needed to identify a holistic nurse and there were some questions that I needed to answer and I used uh, Jean Watson and her work, and I, I, I wish I could find my answers just to see how they look. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that they have changed. And then, as you can see, everything that I've done at all the uh, organizations where I've been at Atlantic Hair Regional Medical Center in New Jersey and now at Stanford Healthcare, I have done my best to basically integrate caring science into my work. And along the ways, knowing that I wanted to get deeper into the uh, study of Watson Caring Science and decided that uh, I wanted to get my, my PhD uh, in nursing and uh, the University of Colorado had their um, Caring Science uh, track. So I started the program in 2014 and completed it in 2020. And the reason why I decided to study um, the role of the nurse leaders who are Caritas coaches in creating a caring healing environment for the staff was purely um, because I was curious to know if people were having the same experiences that I was having. I have been, by the, by the time I decided to become, uh, to do my PhD, I had been already a director or a nurse leader or in some kind of nurse leader role for almost 10 years, uh, probably a little bit more than that. And I was curious, I wanted to know if people were experiencing the same things that I was experiencing, integrating the work into what I was doing, because I understood that when I started practicing my work as a nurse leader through the lenses of a theory, and in this case, Watson Caring Science, that my work started looking very differently, that the way that I was looking at the really mundane, mundane things of, um, of being a leader and managing people uh, and all that kind of stuff, um, it felt different to me. So I wonder, I wonder if other people are having the same experience that I'm having. And so I decided that the, um, the core concept that I wanted to study was Kaita process number eight, which is creating a healing environment and appropriating uh, a healing environment at all levels. And I wanted to see what that felt like. 
uh, for other people to see if it mirror the same experience that I had. So I ended up um, doing a qualitative study. I, um, I was able to include 15 nurse leaders who completed the Caritas Coach program at least two years um, before the study. <clears throat> and the reason why I chose two years is because I needed to make sure that they were already, you know, if you look at the um, novice to expert, the Benner um, novice to expert um, model at two years, you're already doing some of the work and you feel comfortable doing that work. So um, I wanted to make sure that people felt comfortable with the knowledge that they have gained from the program and see if it was being manifested in the work that they were doing. I wanted to describe and understand what were their experiential meanings of creating a caring healing environment <clears throat> and if they were doing it through the lenses of caring science. And <clears throat> the study provided descriptions of relationships and conditions and practices that facilitated and also sometimes interfered um, with the creation of a caring healing environment and obviously everything uh, through their perspective. Now, the other thing that I did, remember that I told you that I was, um, that I came from a family of um, artists. Um, the way that I process um, my feelings and the way that I process, and probably because English is my second language, sometimes I have a hard time finding the right word to describe however it is that I am feeling. And for me, art became that other way of expressing how I was feeling or, uh, or, or any thoughts that I had. So I decided to include, aside from the interview, um, the semi-structure interviews, we, I added an artistic expression um, opportunity so that um, the participants uh, could look at their, um, the answers that they gave me um, in the interviews. I analyzed it and shared with them the story that I thought they told me. And then I gave them the opportunity to describe in an artistic way, not just a painting, but it could have been a poem or a collage or a picture, however they wanted to express themselves at the script of what that story that they told me meant to them. So I used it as a way of triangulating and augmenting the verbal descriptions that they provided on the interview. And if you get an opportunity to um, look at, if you Google it, you can find the, the the dissertation and you can actually see the pictures <clears throat> or the artifacts that they included um, as part of their interview process. So what did I find? So what I found is that <clears throat> these 15 nurse leaders described the essence of creating a caring healing environment as the embodied caring, loving consciousness engage in informal moral actions and practices. And um, I decided to take that and I took a year off. <laughs> Actually, I took six months off. And then I said, okay, now that I, that I did this, I wonder how I am doing this work, how I'm living this embodiment as it relates to the, the findings of my dissertation. So when I decided to um, work with Jean and complete uh, and, and start the postdoctoral um, program, you know, I had the opportunity to do a lot of work. Uh, I could have done a project related to what I do all day long at work, right? I'm, I'm doing some great stuff, integrating caring science here at Stanford Healthcare. 
But I knew that I really wanted to get a better sense of what this meant to me on a personal level. So I decided to do a self aesthetic, uh, aesthetic heuristic inquiry and use heuristic inquiry process to gain knowledge through self-reflection, self-discovery and self-transformation and actually use artistic expression as a way of um, illuminating and uncovering these living experiences that I was having embodying uh, Watson Caring Science. So I am in the middle of this right now. I already presented some of the work that I have done um, to our group in uh, during the summer. And I would like, with your permission, to kind of share some of the things that I have done um, and where my mind is going. So when I, when you look at heuristic inquiry, there are two main questions that it asks. It wants to know what is the experience? Um, you know, how are you in the world? And how do we understand our individual and share experiences through embodiment, perception, um, exploration, self-knowledge and actualization? <coughs> Excuse me. So what I did was my trajectory in uh, of 27 years of, of, of working from the framework of uh, Watson Caring Science. Throughout all this, you know, life is not linear, as we all know. <laughs> it looks really nice on paper, but we all know that throughout um, our, our journey, things happen. And I'm describing those as this little bolt, right? So uh, throughout the many, um, my 27 years uh, with this work, I, um, I've had what I describe as urges or uh, disruptions or something that needed my attention or my healing. So I identified those in, in the, the particular years where they happen. And they were, they range from health crises uh, to death of loved ones, marriage, decisions to leave uh, or decisions to leave a job, start a new one, return to school, COVID, et cetera. So what I did was for my project, I focused my experiences embodying Watson Caring Science during these so-called urges or disruptions. And I wanted to see um, how I experienced embodying Watson Caring Science in both my personal and professional life during these times where you know my life, uh, my linear uh, progression was being, for lack of a better word, tested in my commitment to to be uh, in this path. So I'm going to share with you some of the things that I did. So basically, my question was, what is my experience of embodying Watson Unitary Caring Science? And I'm going to share with you what I'm calling right now Caring Science Postcards. So I have created since 2011, over 400 um, works of art, most of them are either paintings or drawings. Um, yeah. And what I did <laughs> in the project was um, I paired them with quotes from Watson Caring Science that either were used as catalysts for the painting or the drawing or that they resonated. Um, with the sentiment that I that, that I had at the time when I was uh, painting or creating um, the work. So this one um, was from 2011. This one was when uh, I completed the Watson Caring Science um, program, uh, the Caritas Coach program, and they asked us to do something along the lines of, I believe that the question was, um, how do you want the world to see you? Well, uh, the only thing that I needed to do at a time were stick figures. So I saw mm -hmm. myself as a stick figure. And this was supposed to reflect that when people saw me, um, I wanted them to see 
my heart. I wanted them to see the love that I have, not only for them, but for the work that I was doing. And you notice that I have big red shoes and a red nose. At the time, I was uh, volunteering as a caring clown at the hospital where I worked. So that is how I saw myself uh, reflected in the work that I was doing. This one right here, you notice that I also called it Becoming. Um, and this one um, was created and manifested um, about six years later in 2017 when um, I attended a creative art retreat to process the grief of, um, after the death of my husband. Um, she was fit, uh, this becoming, which I call the goddess of um, letting go, open heart and new beginnings. Um, was painted after a guided visualization during the retreat. And there is a message um, that was written in the canvas. And I'm going to read to you what the message says. He wants you, he, he wants you to know, to, he, he wants you to love. He wants you to laugh. He wants you to shine. He wants you to remember you came to give life, to create. He wants you to remember you must follow your path. He wants you to remember you taught him to love, how to cry, how to forget, how to live, and how to laugh. He loves you forever and will never leave your side. So our at this particular moment in time became, as Jean says in this quote, a process for me to ritualizing and sacra uh, sacramentalizing uh, a traumatic event like the death of my husband and releasing and restoring balance and realignment. The other one that I wanted to share with you and this one I'm gonna go really quickly is I began to have um, visions and, and, and deep connections again to the spirit world. And this particular image kept popping up in my, in my dreams um, and in the drawings that I was doing. So I knew that I needed to kind of go back to my roots of prayer and contemplation as I was raised uh, during that time. The other thing that happened was that um, <clears throat> after the death of my husband, um, I started noticing a lot of dragonflies. And if you are familiar with the uh, spiritual meaning of dragonflies, there is a, um, a connection to the spirit world. You know, they say that, that, um, that when, the, when you see a dragonfly, it's a message from uh, the spirit world of your loved one to let you know that they're okay. And this started popping up all over the place. People were giving me, without me even saying anything, people were giving me gifts that had butter, uh, dragonflies in them. I started drawing dragonflies all over the place, etc. Then of course, the acknowledgement of the shadow side, right? Of, of our profession and also not losing hope or creativity um, and, and using that, the, that, that force that, yes, we need to know that there is a dark side within our profession that needs to be healed. And like Jean says, we need to be the light in the institutional darkness. And we also cannot stay dwelling in, in, in that shadow. We need to be able to use, and, and in my case, use her work as an opportunity to really integrate, um, you know, use the Carita processes as my way of elevating the work that I do and raise and uh, increase and raise the consciousness of our work um, so that people, so that I can help heal not only our profession, but heal myself and those around me. 
And again, the idea that I everything that I do needs to be uh, rooted in caring consciousness. And actually, I will be changing this particular one, and I'm changing caring to caritas because that is uh, the, the the level of um, a sacred work that. I want my work to reflect, not necessarily just caring, but that idea of both caring and love as it resonates um, in my work. And then finally, I think there's no, this one of the few ones, um, just planting uh, seeds of love and caring into everything that I do. You know, when I think about um, the, the work, the, how I see myself creating a caring, healing environment, um, as a nurse leader, and I have to say that for long, for the longest time, Carita Process Number One was my favorite. <clears throat> right, the practice of loving kindness. We know that without a practice, <clears throat> a serious practice of loving kindness to myself, and that how that extends to others, nothing that I do is um, going to make um, a bit of difference. Because that sets the stage that that creates the the, the soil from where everything kind of uh, flourishes. However, um, the more I think about it, especially from a nurse leader perspective, um, my favorite Caritas process now is Carita process number eight, um, creating a healing environment because. When you actually read a little bit more uh, on her work, she talks about how there are three levels of environment that we have, right? We have the physical environment, level, a level one environment, what, um, you know, a beautiful space, a beautiful building, flowers, and, uh, you know, all, all the physicality. Uh, that we have around us. And sometimes we get stuck there, right? Where some of us who work in hospitals, we have beautiful buildings. We spend billions of dollars creating these magnificent spaces of quote unquote healing. Then we have level two, which she talks about um, how we repattern the feel, we repattern the environment. That everything that we do becomes, you know, we reframe our tasks into um, caring healing modalities, right? And that we also integrate caring healing modalities so that when we make a bed, there's a scent to it, right? That when we feed somebody, there's some there's reverence to that work that we do, et cetera. And in, in my case, as a nurse leader, when I think of um, repattering the field, that second level, how I see that and how I and that is how I engage my mind is that then everything that I do as a leader or everything that I do as a manager of another, right? Because I, I I have managerial tasks as well. Um, that means that everything that I do from hiring, from performance evaluations, from running a meeting, um, from putting together, um, sorry, Jean, that I'm about to say a bad word, competencies. <laughs> <laughs> um, even when I do that, when I do it through the lenses of Watson Caring Science, they become caring healing modalities for my role, right? Just like making a bed for, for, for a nurse or a nursing assistant becomes a sacred act. So does the way that then I conduct my interviews, the ways that I do my check-ins with my staff when I do them through caring science it, they take a very different uh, meaning. They elevate to that level of carita consciousness. And then of course, the third level, which is an, an expansion of um, Quinn's, um, the nurse as, uh, as the environment, the idea that I can be, even in the midst of all the craziness that's happening around me, 
that my physical self can be the healing environment for another is powerful, right? Because knowing that you are interconnected with another and that your, your energy can have an impact on another human being, that is some profound kind of acknowledgement. <laughs> and knowing that I need to be engaging in loving kindness, right? That I need to, um, to be authentically present to another human being, that I need to engage in spiritual practices so that I can be an, a healing environment for another human being just definitely creates a very different level of how I practice my work every day. So from that moment, so this is why uh, Carita process number eight has become my favorite uh, uh, Carita process because to me, it embodies every single one of the Carita processes into all those levels. And when you read it, right, when you read one of her books and you read it, you start from one, two, three, but the way that you practice, the way that you need to uh, present it to another, it, you start from the third and then you move down to the, to the first. Because unless you are a caring healing environment, self as the nurse leader as a caring healing environment, you're not going to be able to then integrate Watson Caring Science or whatever theory it is that you're using to inform your practice. And unless that gets in, uh, integrated, then it cannot be manifested in physical form at the, at the physical level. So whenever I read it, while I read it one, two, three, the way that I practice it is three, two, one. <laughs> so I am going to stop here and see if there are any reactions because I'm looking that it's 351 right now and I've been talking a lot. So I'm gonna stop and see if there's any questions, reactions to what I just said, if it resonates with you or not. Thank you, Grizel. I'm going to ask for just open comments, thoughts, um, questions that you might have for her. I just um, wanted to say as a, I just graduated this weekend from the Caritas coach program. And I too am a Latina or first generation. Uh -huh. So it's very, very inspiring today. Um, I don't Hi. see, Sorry. oh, I'm not sure. I don't see too many people. Uh, oh. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you're not speaking, if you'd mute yourself so Mel can continue. Okay, great. We're not looking for right at the moment. This is kind of um, advanced planning here. <laughs> um, Lori, I think That's you're awesome. coming through. Um, and Lori, uh, another question: Do you do respite? Well, Mel, go ahead and speak. Sorry. Speak your truth, yeah, and we're yeah. just gonna talk um, to you. Do you sometimes uh, like respite? Like okay. Um, I just wanted to say that it's really, really inspiring for myself as a mm -hmm. first generation Latina, and seeing somebody else that you know um, with the same background in this kind of environment. It's not something that I see too much. So just really, really inspiring. Okay hearing you speak and just seeing what you've done and thank you for for sharing thank you thank you and congratulations on your graduation you know um when i did the when i did my um yeah my my dissertation only one of my <laughs> well, you know, favorite was latina <laughs> so, so i'll be curious to see i would love to do um i would love to do a um and I would love to replicate it with Latina. Um, yeah, now that we have quite a few of them, the because boomer. we have some from Latin America, it will be interesting to see if the responses are the same, you know? <laughs> Teresa, thank you for your thumbs up. And Danielle, thank you. Um, no questions, but much gratitude. I thank you so much. Teresa, 
I see you there and you look like you have a comment. <clears throat> Is there something? I look like I what? Like you have a comment. Oh, um, I just wanted to thank you to, for muting um, Miss Lori. I like the. <laughs> I am slow. My apologies to all of you. No, honey, it's fine. <laughs> I was just trying to not be rude. <laughs> but I I will say, oh, what an awesome, awesome process and through the whole thing. And oh my God, to have Jean here with us <laughs> and to be able to hear and to witness that, that that's just precious. I use Jean as well for my um, holistic nursing certification many years ago. That sure. dates me. So um, yeah, it's just, it's just phenomenal. You've done a wonderful job, wonderful job. And to be in the Stanford system and be able to pull that off, you go girl. Exactly, right. Yeah, Jean can tell you stories, huh, Jean? <laughs> well, it's really quite remarkable to me. Um, the creativity and the scholarship and the personal and professional intersection, uh, uh, bringing it to a form of methodology and science and research and congruence with the whole is just quite remarkable. I mean, she stands alone with the unique uh, combination of her art and her story and her heritage and the way she blends it. It's such an inspiration for me to witness. And that's why I think she, Griselle, almost single-handedly changed the culture at Stanford Healthcare. I mean, really, you know, it's all, you know, left side of the brain, right side of the brain, whichever it is, when she went there. And now she's using art in all the educational programs and all the professional development and has the CNO involved and not the CEO. It's quite remarkable. But it just shows you the, the, the strength of having that consciousness and that knowledge and that centeredness to be able to give voice and language to what we have to offer is really quite powerful. And the uniqueness of our individual gifts and talents that we just manifest, it's, it's, it's a privilege to, to be a part of this, all of us. Thank you, Jean. And I, I, I do have to give kudos to my, um, to my boss. I, I report directly to the CNO, Dale uh, Beatty, who's also a, a Caritas coach, um, because he, uh, he he understands my Puerto Rican brain <laughs> and appreciates it and understand my holistic um, approach to my work and, and, and seeks to understand more when he doesn't get something and, and has been very, um, very generous with not only financially, but also money and I, I mean, money, obviously, but also time and and ensuring that we have everything that we need and, and connecting us. He's a connector. He connects us to the right people to continue with the work. So it's great to, to work in partnership with him. Brazil, I wanna share with you and the group that, oh, probably maybe 10 years ago, we did the role delineation study to identify the practices of holistic nurses. And there was like one or maybe two articles about the use of art and the value in nursing. And somebody said, well, it's really not out there. It's really not published. And, you know, and we said, oh, we're going to test this. We're going to put it out there and we're going to see if it prevails. And now it has become so important um, because it accesses aspects of our being, our consciousness, our inner mm -hmm. soul, that you really can't do well with as well necessarily with uh, the traditional logical, analytical words or programs mm -hmm. or technology. So I want to say that I absolutely loved your art. And I'm Thank thrilled you. to hear that you're using it with your nurses because it is inspiring, hopeful, fills our soul, and um, helps other people see the value of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Actually, one of the things that we did for uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, as we did it, it was part of our uh, Cinco de Mayo celebration. I'm a, I'm a member 
of the Latinx uh, Employee Resource Group here at Stanford. And one of the things that we did was um, I created, we create, we we, um, we did a virtual um, art exhibit. We requested art from our staff, whether or not they consider themselves or identify themselves as Latinos. We basically ask anybody to just share with us and we called it the heart of our community, celebrating the diversity and our gifts. And um, we had 33 um, submissions uh, of art from staff, from VPs all the way across to wow. environmental health services, nurses, and anyone in between. And my job was uh, during, when I got sick with COVID, my job was, I, I had nothing else to do <clears throat> as I was recovering. Um, I ended up putting together, curating the, the art exhibit. Um, and it's beautiful, just uh, all the things that people shared um, and their, the preciousness of it all was um, inspiring. Brazil, I hope you will think about whether or not you can publish that with the permission of the artist, because mm -hmm. we are so left-brained in this society and we are so <coughs> biomedically oriented, task-oriented, parts, organ systems oriented. I had somebody say to me, which was really interesting, it's one of our certificates, but she said, um, every nurse should know cardiology. Well, we all do know cardiology. We all do know that the heart plays a very important uh, function, but whether we focus on the heart as a piece or if we function, at, think about it as a whole is very different. Martha mm -hmm. has her hand raised to share something with us. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. This has been wonderful. I'm in Minneapolis. I'm outside. I've been in a hammock listening to you and looking at your art. <laughs> <laughs> and I um, loved hearing the kind of refreshing about Jean Watson, and it's really pleasant to see you here, Jean. I, oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so it's great to see everybody here. And I just wanted to make one comment. When I took Jean's course, that I can't remember the full name, The Caring Science, I remember when I learned it, and I was like, this is just common sense. Like, everybody knows this. But it's not common sense for everybody. And listening to you, Grizel, your presentation today and how you apply it um, and, Whoa. you know, just really talk about it with your practice was really helpful for me. And it's like, yeah, this is really, really important theory. Um, and I wanted to share my own experience with sharing art. That class was the first time that I had where you could um, and it reminded me of you when you said this with your nursing leadership team, where you said they could respond with their art. And that was the case in the coursework that we could respond with our art. And um, I did do that because I am an artist as well as a nurse, a holistic nurse. And so I had shared a piece. I started out as a basket maker and I've moved it into sculpture. And so I shared a piece that I had made that was a large spiral and that I had um, inventoried my materials so that if I wanted to make it again, I would know how much material it took. So I, it had taken 206 pieces. And one of the other nurses in the course pointed out, she said, you know, did you do that on purpose? And I said, what? And she said, there's 206 bones in the human body. And I'm like, oh my God, of course I know that. And like, it was just this validation of what I know is coming through my work and my art. And so that was just great validation to be interacting with other nurses and sharing art and talking about it. So thank you for bringing that into your presentation. It was wonderful. And I thought, where do we buy your postcards? <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I did create some postcards. Um, I just wanted to see what it looked like. I actually created a mug. Um, I made a mug and a, a mouse, a, a mouse pad, and and some postcards because I just needed to see what what they uh, what they look like, and they do they look cute. <laughs> I'm just you know I send them to people as thank you cards and things like that. Um, but yeah, to your point, you know, I, 
I am not, I love journaling, but I hate writing. I, I don't know. I, I spend so much time talking and writing at work that I, I, I'm, at the end, I have nothing else to say. <laughs> um, so my journals are basically my pictures, my drawings, and I fill them, you know, whenever I feel very taxed, um, my heart feels tight or my brain feels heavy. I just go to the journal and I start um, and I just start drawing and painting. And for those of you, there's a couple of people here that I know that uh, are also my Facebook page. When you see me posting my drawings on uh, Facebook, that means that Griselle is processing a lot. <laughs> so, so that that is how I do it. And it's so nice to just have something next to you. You know, I have like this whole bag of um, a tote bag uh, filled with uh, my journals and every single one of them has a, uh, a drawing in it. I put in the chat the link to, um, to the virtual art exhibit that we created. So you can look at it. I was the curator. <laughs> I can put that in my resume. <laughs> It was fun. Anything else? I know that we're like five minutes, our past commitment, our, our time commitment. Thank you, Jean. <clears throat> I have a quick question for Zoom user. Would you please uh, put in your chat your full name so we can give you credit for attending? Um, and um, I want to say that, and, and Grizel, I'm not shutting you off right now. I'm just wanting to get it in before people leave. That is, if you don't get your certificate for the continuing competency hour, it's our mistake. Um, you know, we did send out um, the email links this morning and some people did not get them. Um, so uh, know that you're not being slighted. Um, it just went somewhere and it didn't come to you. So let us know and we'll make sure you get your certificate. Um, Griselle, um, have you had a chance to look at the amazing comments you've gotten from people in your in the chat? Yeah, thank you, thank you. And I know that uh, you save all these things with the recording. I would love to have them. You know, I I was talking to my dad and I told him that I was doing this today, and I, I keep calling him my dad. He's my stepfather. My father, my biological father, died uh, many years ago. Um, but my stepdad has been my dad since I was 13. So as far as I'm concerned, he's my dad. <laughs> and I call him that. And so I was telling him that I was doing this. And um, and he he said to me, and I said to him, isn't it funny that people want to hear <laughs> what I what I what I what I do and how you know being Puerto Rican um, has influenced the work that I do and and he says, you know what, Griselle, sometimes God has a way of finding the right person to share the one thing that people need to listen to. Uh, so I trust that today, I, uh, as my dad said, that um, my words landed somewhere in your heart and that um, whether it is Watson Caring Science that you're using as your holistic nursing theory or any other, um, I hope that you are doing it from a place of love and compassion and that um, the work that you're doing really aligns with, um, with your personal beliefs, right? Um, I, I still remember having a conversation with um, Mickey, um, when I was going to renew my, um, my holistic um, <clears throat> nursing certification many moons ago. And she said to me, I said to her, you know what, I'm not taking care of patients anymore. Um, so I don't know what, how, I couldn't answer one question. I think it was something along the lines of, how are you integrating holistic nursing into your practice or something along those lines? <clears throat> so she got her, she's like, I need to talk to you, Grisel. So we're talking and I'm driving. And she says to me, what does holistic nursing actually means to you, Grisel? <laughs> I'm like, what? I'm going to have an oral exam. I'm thinking as I'm driving. <laughs> and, and I 
said, well, honestly, to me, when I think, you know, when I think about holistic nursing, I just don't think about aromatherapy and Reiki and none of those things. I think about how I show up into my interactions with other human beings. How do I, what is the, the, what is the inside of me that reflects in my interactions with others? As Jean would say, you know, you're, you're the, the transpersonal caring moments, right? And she goes, you passed. <laughs> you will be getting your certificate. <laughs> that was the one thing. And I thought, okay. So, so yeah, so that when I think about how do I integrate holistic nursing into my leadership practice, it's about how I show up, you know, and how I, I, I relate to other human beings and, and, and how, how lucky am I? to be able to do in through the lenses of, care, of Watson Caring Science and also knowing that as a nursing, we have so many other ones that we can choose from, right? It's not just that one. So you can mix and match all you want. <laughs> you can mix and match. And I think that, you know, that as, as I get older and, and spend more time in holistic nursing, it's been over four decades now, I think about that mix and match because everything has something to offer. And it's that holistic perspective that when I pull, when I'm gifted with the different um, offerings of the different theorists, it only enriches my practice. And whether it's practicing, as you said, Griselle, as a leader, and boy, are they lucky to have you, or as a theorist or as a bedside. Today, I had a conversation with a group and I said, you should be using your knowledge base in any role you show up in. It's not only at the bedside. If you have this knowledge base, for example, in school nursing, you're going to show up and use it as an educator. You're going to use it as a researcher. But it's so different than how we, we think of it that way. But when you come from a paradigm where it's disease, illness, organ focus, people don't think about it that way because they fragment everything. Yeah. One of the things that we're doing right now at Stanford, and, and you know, and sometimes it, it seems daunting, right? Such a big organizations and you're never, first of all, don't ask anybody for permission because they're never going to give it to you. So you just do whatever it is that you need to do. <laughs> I, you're recording this. So anyway. um, just ask for forgiveness later. Um, just start in the areas where you have control over it, right? And, and, you, and, and you, can, you can make a difference. And it's taken me a while. I've been here for nine years. And the first few years were not easy by any stretch of the imagination. I'm, I'm not going to paint that everything's been rosy. Um, and one of the things that we're doing right now is we're actually using, because we're an affiliate of Watson Caring Science, we're using her model, you know, the, the, the four buckets of work that we know that if we start integrating this work, you, you begin to see cultural transformation. So in leadership and legacy and education praxis and in inquiry, you know, research or evidence-based practice or however it is that um, you wanna call it or, or that you're doing. Um, and one of the things that we're doing for practice and again, Jean, cover your ears. I'm going to use that word again, confidence. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things that, that I, we decided to do, because my department is responsible for the ongoing, um, the initial and the ongoing competencies for our new staff. Um, I said, OK, we need to integrate Watson Carrying Science already in our professional practice model, but now we need to start adding the language and, you know, where people need to live it, you know, and, and, and where people need to start looking at it. Um, and I let my team do it and they gave me their first um, take on it. And I was like, no, nope, this is not going to happen. Caring and love are not separate from the things that we do. I do not want these to be a separate segment on this giant documentation. We are going to look at every single one of these statements and we are going to include caring science. We're going to translate that into caring science language. So, um, so we started doing that. And, 
And it's been a lot of fun. You know, sometimes you're like, ah, try that process number five. Let me just engage in some positive and negative feelings right now because this is frustrating. But slowly but surely, it's manifesting. And then, and now we're adding it to you know, the check ins that we do with our new grads and the, the learning needs assessment that we're doing with all of our new hires. You know, we're asking people, how do you want to be known as, you know, yeah, here's your name, you know, all these different things. We're integrating um, questions about self-care. So it's explicit from the beginning that that is an expectation um, and putting it from the get-go. So it's it's been a lot of fun to do that and slowly, you know, but surely it's happening. And then something else that we're doing, we're part of uh, our patient experience we collect um, human caring questions that are based on Watson Caring Science in our organization. So we created a human caring dashboard that right now is not public, um, but we are gonna be working along with uh, Jean and her team and Watson Caring Science to analyze the information because we've been collecting this from since 2019 and we haven't done anything with it. So now we're gonna try to see if what is the perception of our patients um, and how we are indeed integrating Watson Caring Science into our work. So it's exciting, but more to come on that. Thank you, Grizel. I, I um, want to say that I thought you did such a beautiful job of showing theory application. Often when we teach students, they're like, what good is it? And you know we're a practice profession, so if you can't apply and use something, then there's a problem with it because you know we all have dust collectors, mental dust collectors, and this was such a beautiful job of showing the growth and the progress and the implementation and the interface of uh, this theory, as well as the what I saw throughout were the four values that you talked about growing up with. It, it was such a beautiful interface here. Does anybody have any other comments or anything else they'd like to share um, before we close? You will be receiving 1.25 continuing competency hours um, for your attendance. And like I said, if you accidentally don't get it, please let us know. Candace, do you have a comment? I do. Griselle, I feel like I know you either from this lifetime or the past. Somehow we have crossed paths. I don't know when. I can't put that together when I saw your name, you know, when this was, um, program was announced. Uh, so I wanted to say that. Um, Mickey, thank you for bringing up values. That was what my comment was about. I do not think that in general about any topic, healthcare or more than healthcare, outside of healthcare, I do not think that as a country and as a global nation of human beings that we are talking about values enough because values drive all things, right? Values drive behavior, values drive decisions, values drive all things. And I would like a movement to start and where I live, I'm trying to do that in the things I'm engaged in to what is the just to sometimes ask the question, what is the value driving this decision? What is the value driving this war, whatever it is? Uh, what is the value that this patient carries that leads them to want this or do this or whatever the situation is? So I'm putting in my thought about values and thank you for bringing that up Grizel um, early on in your one of your opening slides um, I think the world would be a better place if that was happening mm -hmm. secondly about values I want nurses to start talking about what values in the I understand the values driving holistic nursing having been involved for a long time and I've been a nurse almost 50 years, nearly 50 years. But I'm seeing values slip away. It might be in all of the correct statements from all the nursing organizations, but in day to day, I can't find 
any <laughs> loving values driving too much today in healthcare, which of course nursing is a gigantic part of. So that's my um, wish and uh, maybe magic will happen and we will be in a better place. And thank you for re-inspiring me to be an artist again. I've kind of put that aside, Grizel, and I'm, I'm gonna work at that. Thank you. And I thank you, uh, Candace. And I think we need to, um, we probably need to have an, a nursing art and holistic nursing art exhibit. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fantastic? I'm pretty sure that every single one of us can create or dust off something that we've done many, many months ago. <laughs> yes. And and Grizel, um, I want to comment. Candace magic does happen, and it happens one moment, one step, one person at a time. Mm -hmm. And I think that when Grizel shared her values, I thought, what a wonderful way to be raised. Um, one of my elementary schools nearby where my kids went had values and it was a discussion from some parents who thought that values should only be taught like authenticity, honesty, loyalty should only be taught at home. It should not be something in the school system. And so it's really nice to be amongst like-minded people who understand that we are, we are what we do. And I say, you know, the, the, the being is who we are, but how we show up and how we do things demonstrates or highlights or illuminates our being. And so um, I thank you for a fabulous presentation. Um, is there anybody else that wants to say anything else? Because now you're getting into 1.5 continuing. Because <laughs> <laughs> I recognize your time is valuable. Teresa, you're muted. You're muted. Second. You're muted. You're muted, kiddo. <laughs> One more time. Well, it's a, probably a good thing you couldn't hear what I was saying <laughs> and um, the words I was using. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't know a lot of you, but let me say this real quick. I am the chairman for the conference of 2023 committee. And that was actually discussed. And I would love to have an art display at the conference. So if there's anyone that wants to participate in that, help me organize that, we can do it. And there's many of us that don't think we're artists, but we really are. So um, Mickey can get you my email address, contact, yada, yada, yada. So send me an email and let me know what you think. And um, we can try to cut, bring this to fruition. I, I, it's just phenomenal to me that that was mentioned. Both I both. think it's a, that is a wonderful way to um, celebrate our holistic nursing contributions. And yeah. it, nursing, you know, every time I think about holistic nursing, it's like, such an oxymoron. It should be all nurses need to be holistic nurses in exactly. the story. <laughs> I was exactly. like, come on. Right, exactly. Enough already. <laughs> Teresa, could uh, you uh, approach Terry and tell her that you want that in the e news and uh, uh, seek, seek the input of our colleagues? And certainly I will put something out and send your link. I absolutely love the unfolding of an art display that honors everybody's inner soul. Yes, what absolutely, does. absolutely. Yeah, I, I just, somebody happened to mention that, I was already thinking it, and now it's mentioned again. So <laughs> that tells me that the universe is saying, Teresa, you do need it. to do this. <laughs> so. And so let it be, it yes. will come. Love and Martha, the conference is the 6th through the 12th. It is in Orlando, Florida. Um, and uh, you can go to a right? website. June. June. And, uh, I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. June. June. Yes. Did I say May? No, you oh, just oh, said okay. the 6th through the I was just looking at it right before we met. Uh, June 6th through the 11th or 12th. 
Uh, they are still accepting abstracts. And um, uh, so think about um, presenting, maybe on some of your art. And, and um, Teresa, I look forward to, I'm thrilled to hear you're the conference guru. That's very yeah. exciting. <laughs> um, and I'm going to put out right now, because this, this is about experiencing or trying to have the understanding of other people's lived experience. I would really like to see something at the conference where there's an opportunity for nurses to contribute service in some way, mm -hmm. um, you know, and connect with the people that are from that area, the indigenous populations, um, whether it's, you know, an opportunity for a half day to work in a food kitchen or whatever, but I'm throwing that out there because I've got two good feet, more or less, two good hands and a brain, I think, that can contribute. And I've heard people say they want, would like to see something service-oriented. That was discussed, too. Oh, hey, we're all in the same river. <laughs> we are. We're we going to be in Florida, right? And there's been so yeah. much dedication. Mm -hmm. I'm so sure they need. find something. Yeah, 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 yeah. So... In closing, I'm going to say we will be sending you a certificate for 1.5 continuing <laughs> competency hours. It's been absolutely a pleasure to have you join us tonight. We will have another one probably starting in January. The other thing I'm going to throw out there just so you know uh, that's coming is we are going to be offering a bundle of films starting in 2023. Um, I'm not sure if we're partnering with AHNA or not, but it is documentaries that have been made. Um, one is indigenous population in New Mexico, another is um, veterans, another is uh, um, about people who deal with addictions and alcoholism. But the, the goal is to share these documentaries uh, with as big an audience as possible. CEs will be offered. Um, and they will be offered at a very reasonable rate. We're looking at like the five films, which will be somewhere between, um, and we're going to have facilitators. We're going to have live facilitators who represent the population that the documentary is about um, that will facilitate discussion. It will probably be like 7.5 to 10 CNEs, and it'll be like $50 for the five films. So I'm throwing that out there to let you know that that is something we're working on in the idea of understanding and better preparing ourselves to better serve those we serve. Any questions or comments before we yeah, close? Actually, actually, before we go, I just wanna share a reflection that I wrote um, in 2016 uh, during the combined International um, Association of Human Caring and the Rogerian Conference in Boston. Um, so I, this will be my parting words and thank you again for all of you for your generosity of spirit and all the great uh, dialogue that we had today. So this, this, it doesn't have a title, but I'll just, start, I just, I just read it. As above, so below. As north, so south. As east, so west. As my mind, so my thoughts. As my thoughts, so my words. As my words, so my actions. As my actions, so my heart. As my heart, so my ears. As my ears, so my eyes. As my eyes, so my hands. As my hands, so my work. As my work, so my passion. As my passion, so my purpose. As my purpose, so my ethic. As my ethic, so my must, as my must, so I love. Wow. Thank you so much. Namaste. Namaste. Oh. Beautiful. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And have a beautiful rest of the day to everybody. Bye. <laughs>